Okay, this video is do soy and flax cause endometriosis and other diseases. And so basically, you know, I haven't studied flax as much as soy. Um, there's not as many papers on flax as there are on soy. But one of the things that kind of surprised me is, you know, soy, uh, flax, and we'll talk about flax real briefly here. Flax contains something called cyanogenic glycosides that have potentially some relation to cyanide. Uh, almonds also have that. They mentioned sorghum here. So that's just one more reason. I'm not a big fan of flax. I mean, I haven't seen enough papers on it to really feel I know it well, but it's high fat. It's got estrogen off the charts. It's even got way, way more estrogen than does soy. It's a different type of estrogen than soy. Soy is isoflavones. Um, but, you know, I don't see any reason that I need to eat estrogenic flax. I think the whole omega-3 thing is totally exaggerated. You get enough omega-3s from just regular plant foods. So anyways, I thought you might find that amusing that flax has an association with cyanide. Um, here then is like the differences. You know, the, the estrogens in uh, flax are primarily these lignin types uh, versus in soy they're isoflavone types like genistein. Okay, so anyways, they're both thousands of times more estrogenic than any of these other foods like black beans are next and other beans are next to nothing compared to uh, soy and then f flax is off the charts estrogenic and so my thinking is you know why in the world would I want to eat estrogenic fat that'd be the last thing in the world I would want to eat okay and then soy we're gonna talk about endometriosis but I just want to make the point there are tons of papers showing major problems with soy so this is a paper on congenital hypothyroidism, which is a dangerous condition because it'll cause mental retardation, you know, cretinism. Um, so this was just basically saying if a kid has signs of hypothyroid, it's a lot more difficult to correct their hypothyroid if they're giving them soy. You have to give them uh, higher doses of replacement thyroid hormone, level thyroxine. So um, here, it is established that soy products can interfere with thyroid hormone absorption. Uh, so... Here's another paper. I've seen, I've seen, I don't, I'm only, in this talk, every single paper I'm showing you here is new. I've given like three or four previous talks about soy with large numbers of papers showing problems with soy. And I'm, what I'm saying is every single paper in this, in this talk is going to be new and there's a bunch of them. Okay, so here it is. Infants fed soy, pro, fed soy formula had a prolonged increase in TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, compared to infants fed a non-soy formula. These infants may need increased levothyroxine. So these are two papers showing in humans that soy contributes to hypothyroidism. So that's pretty important because people are going to try to tell you, oh, soy is in animals and the humans and the animals are different. No, not, not that as much as you think. When you look carefully at it, it's a typical pattern of old animal studies tell you the truth, then the problems show up in humans, and then industry finds out about it and tries to hide it. Okay, uh, soy, you know, another paper on soy being associated with hypothyroidism, okay? Hypothyroidism is bad. It makes you tired, fat, weak, and stupid, okay? You don't want that. Here's a paper about uh, showing the problems of soy related to contributing to infertility in rainbow trout. The relevance being is that this is not just something with a mouse or with a human. It's a general principle. Soy is estrogenic, and it is harmful to the reproductive capacity of all the vertebrate animals that I'm aware of and humans, okay? Here's another one. Soy lowers testosterone in men. I have other papers from my previous talk. Soy uh, causes like 40 million sperm per square milliliter, you know, cubic centimeter, cc, uh, decreased sperm, okay? I think soy is all about making people infertile. I mean, that's why the plant makes it. So it doesn't want to be eaten, and it makes the animals that eat it infertile and hypothyroid, so they'll stop eating it, okay? And then humans are the only animals stupid enough to seek it out. Okay, soy increased uh, fibroids. Women fed soy formulas. Infants have larger fibroids. Here's another thing about soy and fibroid tumors. Fibroids are a benign tumor of the uterus. They're also called leomyoma. Okay, um, high soy isoflavones or soy-based food intake during infancy or during adulthood associated with increased risk of uterine fibroids. Great. Fibroid tumors in women, sometimes, you know, they're asymptomatic, but they can cause increased menstrual bleeding. They can cause cramping and pain. Okay, here's just something on organochlorine pesticides. They're associated with increased risk of endometriosis because they have estrogenic effects. Here's another paper on organochlorine pesticides, increased risk of endometriosis. So why am I showing you this? Because these are risk factors for endometriosis and also because of the point that you want to eat organic, all right? 
I know not everybody emphasizes organic, but I'm telling you, you want to avoid these pesticides as much as you can. You'd be amazed how much toxicology contributes to disease. And when you eat non-estrogenic food, you're, you're just adding a whole bunch of potential problems. Now, there's some foods where it doesn't matter as much. You can go to the Environmental Working Group, ewg.org, and see their dirty dozen list where it's most important to buy <clears throat> organic. But what I'm saying is all these things add up. GMO soy sprayed with glyphosate, anything with corn in it sprayed with atrazine. It's a lot of estrogenic stuff. The soy, the glyphosate, and the atrazine, it all adds up. Plus, there's a lot of times mercury in high fructose corn syrup. That's also a metalloestrogen. Okay. Okay, now soy formula changes the vaginal epithelium in infant girls. Okay, this researcher, Agent, uh, has done a lot of good research, and they've shown it causes abnormalities of the fallopian tubes, abnormalities of the uterus, abnormalities of the vagina, okay, abnormalities of menstruation, increased fibroids, increased menstrual pain. I mean, how many more uh, female gynae problems do you need? You know, and, and you got all these people on the internet saying, oh, Soy doesn't cause any problems. You're crazy. None of them have read any of these papers. It's obvious. I got all the papers right here. You can go look them up. It's pretty obvious. Okay. Adverse effects of phytoestrogens on reproductive health. These are just three case reports, but it makes the same point. Three, three different women with abnormal uterine bleeding and uh, problems with their endometrium, you know, the lining of the uterus. And it was all related to high intake of soy products. As soon as they stopped the soy, all the women started improving. Okay, soy effect on menstrual cycle in uh, women. So it, it'll, it'll distort some of the phases. Some of them will be longer or shorter. Anything that's interfering with the menstrual cycle of a woman, with the myometrium, the muscle lining of the uterus, with the vagina, with the fallopian tubes, with the endometrium, the inner lining of the uterus on, on which the baby implants, they're going to decrease fertility. Okay, I mean, isn't that obvious? Soy-based formula, more menstrual pain when we got older. So when you feed soy formula to a baby, really that's a disservice to the baby. Not only you have the estrogenic soy, which can generate very high estrogenic chemical levels in the baby's blood, you've also got the aluminum can. Aluminum is a metalloestrogen. The can is often typically lined with BPA. That's an estrogenic plastic. Then it's heated up, which causes more leaching of the estrogen in a plastic bottle. And then the baby bottle has a nipple made out of BPA, not uncommonly. So the baby gets more from that. And then you can say, well, BPA has been banned. Yeah, they just make BPA substitutes that are also just as estrogenic. So you're not gonna win that game. Glass mm -hmm. bottles better. Um, okay, so these are just more problems with soy. Some of the common well-known risk factors for endometriosis. Endometriosis is just when the person menstruates that the blood instead of coming out of the person as it typically does some of it will go retrograde backwards through the fallopian tubes and out into the abdomen and then blood as it gets reabsorbed it contracts you know, like you get a scar on your arm if you cut yourself and as it contracts it causes these um, fibrous bands between other tissues those are called adhesions and these can lead to infertility it can lead to a lot of pain so if a woman never had any kids she's got increased risk of uh, endometriosis, late menopause, basically, you know, prolonged increased estrogen exposure, if you will, not, uh, not broken by menstruation or pregnancy. Uh, chronic heavy periods is an indicator she might be at increased risk for endometriosis, other relatives with it, etc. Things that lead to higher estrogen levels, eating meat. Okay, um, we talked before about basically soy has got estrogen off the charts and flax is even worse. Why do they have such high estrogen levels? In a woman here, it's obvious why she's got high estrogen. She's got breasts, she's got a Virginia. It's part of her reproductive physiology, okay? There's no reason for the soy to have it except to function like a pesticide to the animals that eat it. It doesn't want to be eaten. You know, a bear might eat berries and then walk around and defecate them out miles away and create new plants for that type of berry. But some plants don't want to be eaten, so they make chemicals to prevent themselves from being eaten. So by producing very high estrogenic chemicals, soy can make the animal that eats it infertile, and they can also cause hypothyroidism in the animal. So maybe that'll get the animal to stop eating it. But when humans are stupid enough to eat this stuff, and especially in high amounts, they run the risk of making themselves infertile, hypothyroid, or having other problems. Now here's a paper about soy and endometriosis. So soy intake since prepubertal age may contribute to pathogenesis of endometriosis in adulthood. 
Ovarian function was altered. Regular soy consumption may promote endometriosis in adults, especially if the soy content in the food is more than 10%. Um, one thing people too ask me about soy as well is, you know, soy and an Asian person eating it out of their backyard the same as an American? And the answer is probably not. The American soy is probably eating GMO soy, and quite often it's processed with hexane. You know, the more processed it is, the worse it gets. But even if it wasn't processed at all, it's still soy. It's still high in estrogen. I wouldn't need it. It's high in fat. It's high in protein. It's got heme iron. Those are things I don't want. Okay, another paper on early life factors and endometrius risk. Uh, Upson here has written a bunch of papers on this subject. Women who were regularly fed soy formula as infants had more than twice the risk of endometriosis. And so our results support the hypothesis that disruption of development during fetal and infant periods may increase the risk of endometriosis in adulthood. Okay, so that was really sort of the main point of the talk and uh, just making the point that there's, there's, you know, tons of papers showing problems with soy and it interferes with the woman's reproductive tract in multiple different ways and it also interferes with the male, lowers his testosterone level and decreases sperm production and those are additional reasons why I think it's wisest to avoid it.